Today on the 2020 Awards podcast, we're looking back at Jane Campion's film, The Piano. I'd like us to make a deal. There's things I'd like to do while you play. If you let me, you can earn it back. What do you think? One visit for every key. My guest today is Stuart Schill. Stuart is a writer, director, and editor whose many credits include American Horror Story, Battlestar Galactica, and Dexter. He's currently wrapping up post-production on a second feature film that he directed, Frank vs. God. Welcome to the show, Stuart. Thanks, Chris. It's really great to be here. The Piano was written and directed by Jane Campion. Said in 1850, The Piano is the story of a mute woman played by Holly Hunter who, along with her daughter and her prize piano, are sent to New Zealand as part of an arranged marriage to a plantation owner played by Sam Neill. While the husband has no interest in the piano, one of his workers, played by Harvey Keitel, buys the piano as a way to get private lessons from Holly Hunter, whom he fancies. Hunter and Keitel begin a love affair, but meanwhile, Sam Neill grows more and more frustrated as Hunter refuses to interact with him. When Neill discovers their tryst, he sequesters Hunter in their home. She removes a key from her piano, inscribes a love note to Keitel, and sends her daughter to deliver the message. However, her daughter instead brings the note to Neil, who punishes her by chopping off one of her fingers and sends it to Keitel. Uh, there's some kind of an odd dream thing where Neil hears a voice that tells him to release Holly Hunter, who then leaves the island and moves away with Harvey Keitel, and they live happily ever after. 20 years ago, it opened to very strong reviews, did modestly at the box office, pulling in $40 million. The Piano received eight Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture and Director, and took home the gold for Holly Hunter's performance, Best Screenplay, and Anna Paquin became the youngest person to receive an Oscar for her supporting role. Second youngest. Second youngest? Tatum O'Neill was 10 for Paper Moon. Good for her. So, uh, Stuart, did you, uh, did you see this 20 years ago? Yeah, I saw it when it came out. Yeah. And I remember really liking the movie a lot when it came out. Yeah. And um, had not thought about it much in the meantime, but so I was, it was really, I was glad to have a chance to revisit this movie. And um, it, what really struck me about it actually was um, it, how dated it was in a way. I mean, it's a beautiful film and it totally holds up in my opinion, but what was kind of striking is they just, we really don't make movies like this anymore. You know what I mean? I feel like um, it had this really strong female sensibility that even though arguably, you know, women directors and women filmmakers may be even more prominent now, I feel like they've had to become more sort of masculine in their orientation. And to make a somewhat, you know, sort of mainstream movie like this from a very feminine perspective, I think just that's what really struck me when looking at it again 20 years later is that 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 sensibility seems missing now. Hmm. You know what I mean? Interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess you're probably talking about, like, Catherine Bigelow. Catherine Bigelow is obviously a a great example. You know, uh, Hurt Locker and uh, Zero Dark Thirty, very very male sort of. Right, and that's a big thing for female directors now. It seems like it's almost a rite of passage to have to prove how macho you can be and compete with the boys, which clearly Jane Campion was not trying to do with this movie. Right, yeah. And um, another thing that's kind of striking, and maybe this isn't even so much about the femininity of it, you know, it's not like a girly film, but you know what I'm saying in terms of like the narrative and the storytelling is, I think, from a very sort of female perspective. I can't imagine a man writing that movie or making that movie. Well, I mean, I think (laughs) to your point... I, I think it uh, it's not a very girly film, but it kind of felt like lady porn to me. <laughs> <laughs> it really did. It felt like a, it really felt like kind of a fantasy. What? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know what he's saying in that. As a lady, it was no fantasy to be. I don't know. Yeah, I don't get. Well, regardless of whether or not Harvey Keitel is your no, idea no, no, of no, a fantasy. No, 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 no. but I mean, certainly not to be sort of a, in an arranged marriage, but. I don't know. There was just something about it that really felt like, like I kind of was thinking, how did Fabio not get cast as Harvey Keitel in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I I, th- I agree with what Chris is saying. I don't know if you know. I think it's pornographic in that way, but that it's a female fantasy in the sense that, um, first of all, she's so clearly starting with like the. You know, Harvey Keitel sort of representing this carnal, natural, you know, state of being, and then Sam Neill representing more the uptight, you know, overly encultured kind of, you know, uptight 
sensibility. And so, that, so that's essentially what the narrative kind of explores. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, um, not to get off the lady porn point, which is a good point, <laughs> <laughs> but um, another thing that struck me just in, in putting this in like historical perspective is that I loved, I kind of love that. I mean, I don't know if I can say I love the movie, but it was cool to revisit and refreshing in that the fact that you could write a movie and make a movie that was a really well-crafted movie that essentially is just exploring that that divide from a feminine perspective of, you know, um, and we could talk about all the different ways this is referenced and explored in the movie, but like the her um, being caught between the natural world and the, you know, the constrained um, European culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot of like narrative drive in the movie. Something didn't happen on page ten. It was really just an exploration of this journey that she yeah, goes no, on. Yeah, it just it sort of unfolds. It sort of unfolds. Right. I thought in a compelling way, and I I just it's another thing that struck me, and maybe it's just because my head is so in it or whatever. But like, I feel like there's a tyranny these days of everyone has read Save the Cat and everyone has read Sid Field, and we all know that something has to happen on page ten, and you got to state this on page three. This movie totally didn't follow that. And, um, and like I said, it was, was very compelling anyway. And it's just, I just enjoyed like remembering how movies can be so, you know, have such unique perspectives and storytelling. And I feel like we've gotten way more homogenous in how, mm -hmm. how movies are made now. Yeah. I mean, I tend to, I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I think, uh, my experience was with this was I kind of, I don't want to say it was dragged to it, but but my ex and my mom wanted to see it, and so we all went to see it together. And and you I watched this movie with your mom. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and I wasn't like I wasn't blown away by it at the time, but I remember really liking it because it was visually told, and and that's something that I also find very rare. And that's like I'm a big stickler for that. It's like I really like it when you can watch a movie with the volume turned off and mm -hmm. this is something you could watch and follow and understand what was happening pretty much without having to have dialogue and and uh but seeing it again I was actually kind of like oh yeah you know there's a reason it hasn't really there's a reason I didn't fall in love with it 20 years ago it just sort of like you felt even back then that it was kind of dragged for you, or, or didn't sustain your interest in a way. It didn't sustain my interest. It's, I mean, again, I think it's, I think it's a well-crafted film. I think it's well directed, but it just, it, there's nothing about it that kind of like stayed with me. And and so when I saw it again, it was like, oh right, this happens. Oh See, I yeah, feel like that I had happens. the opposite experience in revisiting because I remember seeing it at the time, and I would say 1993 was probably you know the pinnacle of my you know, film, cine, cinematic snobbery, you know, right. and yeah. um, I would have thought that I would have totally gravitated to a movie like this. I don't remember it striking me in a deep way at the time. I felt like now, with who I am now, it had a richer, uh, it was a richer experience to me. Huh, interesting. And the relationship with Harvey Keitel, I thought, was what really unfolded in a very compelling and interesting way that, that I appreciated even more now as, yeah. a, as a middle-aged guy. Um, and I, I think you touched on something which I think is also a remarkable thing about this movie. And I, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if it happens today or not, but it was a cool choice and a very cinematic choice. And I, back then and even now, that to me that is like one of the greatest attributes in a movie is how cinematic is it? How much can this movie, like you said, you know, watch a movie with the sound turned mm -hmm. off, I agree. Um, but also like, and this is something you and I both had drilled into our head in film school, which is... What makes this a movie as opposed to anything else? Why couldn't this be a novel or a radio play or a book, you know, right. something? Um, this movie was inherently cinematic, and the yeah. choice to make your main character mute and that um, <clears throat> her voice was the piano, which is musical. Mm -hmm. And I was really cognizant this time that the only time we ever saw Holly Hunter smile was when she was playing the piano. Right. You know, it was very clearly, you know, expressive and very much her voice. There was a really nice moment in the movie, too. Um, I was trying to think about the editing as I was watching this movie, because, and as I said, it's always hard to comment on the editing, but one thing I was aware of um, editing-wise is I think there were two dissolves in the entire movie, so obviously very carefully chosen where they use them. And the, the one point that really struck me was there's a beautiful shot somewhere in the second half of the second act or something where it's on Holly Hunter's back, she's in the woods, 
there was a cool thing too that I sort of noticed. I noticed Jane Campion's um, style was much more this time too, or I was much more tuned into it. But anyway, let me finish this one point, which is we're on Holly Hunter's back and the camera slowly pushes into the back of her head and she always had this very interesting design mm -hmm. in her hair, but we're going like literally right into her cranium and then it very slowly dissolves to this beautiful kind of abstract shot of trees and the woods and the music comes up, the piano mm -hmm. music. And it was really effective. Like we're really getting in her head and in her head, the language is music. I thought right. that was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was dreading watching this. I didn't see it 20 years ago. I thought it, it, I thought it would be really, really boring. It just sounds really boring to me. So I didn't watch it till this morning. Um, and I was really dreading it. Really? I loved it. It was beautiful. Just from like the first, it grip, got me from like the opening credits. And the first shot, like this is a beautiful movie. The acting was, you know, some kind of Harvey Keitelish stuff I wasn't fond of. But the acting was terrific. It was beautiful. I was into the story. Had I really you, liked it. Is this the first time you've ever I'd seen never, it? Yeah, first time I saw it was today. But your impression of it going into it was it's going to be boring. It's going to be boring. Yeah. I can understand that. I mean, it was kind of boring. And it wasn't. Boring. So <laughs> I wasn't bored. I mean, it kind of, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I'm an hour and a half into this movie. So, okay, so am I wrong? Does she say at the beginning of the movie she chose to not speak? No, I remember her saying, first of all, that was interesting that it was bracketed. The only time we heard the voiceover was at the very beginning, the very yeah. end, and that voice was so strange. I, I think I, it was supposed to be her as a six-year-old when she stopped speaking. Right. Right. It's, it was, that was the impression I got. She stopped speaking, of, like, right? Voice. She stopped speaking at six. I think she chose to. Right. No, I, I, that's what I thought. And I thought that's a I really she, weird. I remember her saying in that opening voiceover that she, um, that she stopped talking, but nobody knows why, not even her. That's what I remember her saying. It was so long ago that I saw this movie. <laughs> <laughs> At least. <laughs> At least five At hours least ago. At least four or five hours ago. See, I remember her saying, I swear. I, I know I, she was six. I, I swear she said she chose to stop talking. And I remember thinking like, Okay, see, that to me is a red flag where I'm like, why? I always find it weird when characters choose stuff, right? So it's like, if you choose to stop talking, that's a very strange thing to me. It's like, like why did you choose to stop talking? Well, it's interesting that we both heard that differently, and regardless that... Um... Obviously, one of us chose to stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, to, you know, but... <laughs> Um, that she chose to stop talking and that uh, the movie never really addresses it or, or delves into it. It's not right. kind of relevant as far as she's concerned. It's know? not, but I think it's one of those things where it's like, as a choice for the writer to make, why would you not just have her mute then? Why bring it up at all? That's a really good question. Well, there was a weird sort of moment, too, where um, she almost starts to vocalize with Harvey. And, right. And then Sam Neill hears her voice in his head. And right. That's, that's what happens, right? Yeah. That's what, see, that's what, again, it's like, and then he decides to let her go because he hears a voice in his head. Right? Well, that was her. I, I no, got no. that and as she tried. No. So that was what? after. That was after he, he chopped her finger off. Yeah. Um, she says, or he, he he lets her go because he hears her like say something to him. Yeah, but but, but what Sam Neill thought he heard, and he's telling Kaitel about it. I think right. He's well, saying, I think he went over and asked Kaitel, "Have you ever heard of her speak to you in your mind?" And he right. said he didn't. Yeah, but just, she was trying to get like I think the back story was that she tried to speak to the English teacher and get him to fall in love with her with her mind, and it didn't work. Lady porn. <laughs> To me, that's, yeah, that's, just, that's why I keep coming back to that. The piano, two words, lady porn <laughs> by Chris Christensen. <laughs> um, I do think, it, I mean, it, it is a really gorgeous movie. It's one of those movies that reminds me of a, of a Coen Brothers film, which is the thing that I do love about their movies is that it is really rich. It, and it feels like you can touch the screen, you know, and you'd be like, oh, it's, this, this environment is cold and wet and... Right. Yeah, she did a really good job evoking that environment yeah. and yeah. that world. And what I was going to say, what I, I thought I noticed as sort of a, a principle that she must have had, that whenever we saw sort of the Europeans, it was always like really long lenses. They were really detached from that environment. And then when we were in the Harvey Keitel, Holly Hunter world, they were much more a part of nature. It was much you know more in focus. And 
Um, oh, that's interesting. And I, didn't, color, I didn't pick up on that. That's a, that's a great observation. Though. And even the color scheme, you know, it was so yeah. desaturated, but right. really emphasizing all the blue and kind of earthy, rainy right. tones. Right. Until you went into uh, Harvey's hut. Harvey's hut. What, didn't they have a little sign over at Harvey's hut? <laughs> no, that's a bar that I like to go to. Harvey's <laughs> hut. They say. have karaoke on Wednesdays. Yeah. <laughs> but he did have barbecue there. <laughs> and little uh, bamboo cups with umbrellas. Yeah. <laughs> um, but his Harvey's hut was really warm. That was the one place in the mm-hmm. movie that felt uh, all the all the production design was really warm colors and warm tones, and it was yeah, it was beautifully production designed yeah. and everything. Yeah, and all those that imagery of the piano on the beach and stuff, I thought was gorgeous. And by the way, you know, if you got that script, yeah, you, you know, it's only three pages long. <laughs> <laughs> For a uh, for a uh, an actress to get a role like that is is, is great, but um, that could have easily been that love story with Harvey Keitel, and especially casting Harvey Keitel was a weird choice. Yes, um, oh man, that that could have so easily, if it was not handled just right, and not you know when we can argue whether or not you think it was. I thought it was handled really beautifully. Um, that could have just fallen flat. That was so dangerous. That was a tightrope, and I thought that it, that was one of the most remarkable things about this movie. Is that, I, as, it, as I said, that the way that relationship unfolded, I was I totally bought it. I was totally in it, and that's what kept the movie engaging to me. I think my favorite part was when she took the piano key, and gave it to him, just because she was taking the thing that she loved and was. Making it just part of herself. She's yeah, giving him the yeah, only part of herself right. she could. But it also, you know, here's the thing that she loved that she couldn't. I mean, the piano is useless without the key. So I, I gotta say, that's that's one thing that threw me out of the movie a little bit. It's like, well, if you're gonna give him a key, why not give him that low key or that high key that you never <laughs> use? Why would you give him middle C? I mean, come on. Because she really <laughs> loved him. Is yeah, that exactly. an indication of I mean, how much yeah. you love? I mean, you give like one of those lo- lesser keys. Like that's like a third date key. <laughs> yeah. This is like, how would he know? He didn't know life. anything about the piano. He didn't she give knew. a damn about the piano. She knew. Oh, but he wanted to learn how to play. <laughs> and by the way, the way she used that piano narratively, that was brilliant. The the ticking clock of the black key. Oh yeah, yeah. That was really good. Yeah. No, there was I, stuff, there was stuff like that that I really did enjoy. And and but and if you're gonna write a scene where Hyver Keitel's gonna like you know strip half naked, get underneath the piano, and look up her dress, like how could that not on paper look disgusting. like it's gonna be a disaster and I, I, that, that, that was a Harvey gorgeous Keitel. moment. I especially was, with Harvey Keitel. I was laughing. You were laughing? Okay, yeah. I was not because I watched it on an airplane. But I liked it. <laughs> um, and I, I totally love the moment. You're making me feel like kind of gay now, Chris. <laughs> Sake to, to love a beautiful movie. The, um, <laughs> the moment where he just sort of fondles that little run in her stockings. I love that. I thought that was great. You hated it. You know what I could use right now, Chris? Some honest tea. Really? Well. Tell me about it. You know, honest tea is pretty good, Lee, because Stuart, our guest today, showed up. He was having a bad day. He was a little parched, too. He was a little parched. Parched but, and but flustered. But he, he was flustered and stressed, right, Stuart? Yeah, this was like a tonic to my soul. Well, honest tea, because nature made it right, we put it in a bottle. Refreshingly honest. Visit <sighs> honesttea.com to find a distributor near you. Also, our other sponsor today is the Grand Illusion Theater. Located in a converted dentist's office, the Grand Illusion is Seattle's classiest, weirdest, and completely volunteer-operated cinema, screening the world's finest art house, foreign and revival films. Located in the University District, right across from the Jack in the Box. For more info, visit grandillusioncinema.org. What do you mean you don't want your clothing or your kitchenware to come? Is that what you mean? We can't leave the piano. Look, let's not discuss this any further. I'm very pleased that you arrived safely. Mother wants to know if I could come back directly for it. Could I apologize for the delay, which I regret was done? After they've taken the other things. Best sound designed by Lee Smith and Peter Townend, not Townsend. Any, what do you think? I was actually pretty cognizant of the sound design yeah. of that because uh, my head's sort of in that space right now, but... Um, it was. I wouldn't say it was remarkable, but I, it was noticeable that they really yeah. created those jungle atmospheres yep. really well. And can I just also say that um, was anybody else struck by the fact that they trudged through the jungle with these all these Maori dudes to some little village that we never really see, we never really know what they're doing there, and all of a sudden they're putting on a pageant when there's a bunch of other Europeans like out there. Kid. Like, I like had no sense of what this place was that they were living in the middle of the jungle. 
Because like the English people had a pretty decent house, it seemed like. It seemed like, but they still they had to walk through planks and mud to get to somebody else's house, and then all of a sudden it seemed like he was working the land. Was it a farm? Civilized, and he had to send away for this mail order bride that was obviously damaged goods if she was like knocked up by. And she had a kid. Yeah, so uh, the context made no sense. I was I was confused by that, but anyway, sound design was good. (laughs) (laughs) It it wasn't nominated for sound design in '93, but um, but Geronimo in American Legend was. Totally forgot a yeah. forgettable movie. I never saw it. Yeah, no, I thought it was. I thought it was really good. I, it's it's one of those things. It's not obvious, and uh, but it was very rich. It was very and that and the atmosphere really was yeah. a, a very prominent part of it. Yeah, yeah. Best costume by Janet Patterson. It was nominated for best costume. Yeah. Lost to the Age of Innocence. It was great. Oh. I thought. Mm-hmm. I thought the wardrobe was was really yeah. excellent. Yeah, uh, very authentic. Um, very just her big. whole sort of like that she was restricted. Her costumes felt very restrictive. And yeah, and good, um, good use of the uh, hoop dress for a tent. For a tent, that it's was clever. That was very clever. Um, chick porn, as you would say. <laughs> lady porn. Lady porn. Sorry. Chick porn. Please. Chick porn's a little dirtier. There was a lot of yeah. mud in that movie. Yeah. I, you know, I think in this movie the um, the wardrobe and the the set design and all those details were really an important part of the storytelling and I thought you know everyone's dishing on Harvey Keitel but um, I thought he was great and um, they did a really she did a really good job of sort of evoking the sense of a guy who was much more in touch with his primitive nature and stuff and all the details of how he was styled and dressed and you know everything his his house and I thought that was really excellent well in the next category is best art direction by Andrew McAlpine and yeah I agree it's again everything that was visual about this movie. I think just just like phenomenal, mm-hmm. absolutely striking. It, it Wet. Not dominated in '93. Only oh, it wasn't. four films were, and it was not one of them. Best cinematography: Stuart Dryberg. Again, very cinematography rich, was excellent. luscious, gorgeous. Yeah, I actually uh, I was wondering about that because nowadays that look, which is kind of really prevalent through commercials and any David Fincher film, where it's sort of um, a little bit washed out and kind of cold. Um, I think that was a fresher look back then, and mm-hmm. obviously they didn't do digital intermediates then, so I think the DP really had to know exactly what he was doing yeah. and have a very deliberate look in mind. I thought it was really good. Mm-hmm. Best original score, Michael Nyman. Yeah, you know, the music did not strike me so much in this aside from the obvious piano playing. Did, did oh, you really? Have a, did you I thought it was music? good. It was very haunting and sort of atmospheric, I thought. I think, I, again, I think it was just another one of those layers that made me feel like I was actually there. Yeah. Do you recall, I, 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 my recollection is that they didn't use the piano as a, as a voice in the underscore when it wasn't actually being right. played, right? Yeah. 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 So it was good. Yeah. Um, best Supporting Actress, Anna Paquin. Wow. Great. Phenomenal, right? She's good, yeah. She was... I mean, no, no. I'm, Chris, I, not I, a I don't think so. I, uh, eh. she was like, she was like a ten year, nine years old when that movie was made. Yeah. But here's the thing, that's that's extraordinary already. But there's very often you'll see a nine year old that gives an incredible performance as a nine year old. You never hear from her again. But she obviously had the chops because we were just talking about it. I mean, she's, she's still she's on a big hit series now. Yeah, and she's she's the real deal. And it was I think it was really abundantly evident at nine years old. I thought she was really carried that movie, and that was a huge role to have to be. You know, carry she carried a lot of it. You think really? You don't think so? No, I didn't get that impression. That she had to be the cipher and the conduit for the Holly Hunter character? Yeah, but I don't know. You just don't like kids. I don't. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think Susan Anna Paquin certainly deserved the nomination, if not the award, in my estimation. All right. Uh, best Supporting Actor, Sam Neill. He had a thankless role. Yeah, it wasn't. Anybody could have done it, it seems like. I just felt like I didn't feel empathy for him no. when you could have because it's like look here you know you've ordered this mail order bride and then you know she wants nothing to do with you but the other side of that coin is and like she's kind of a tease about it too she kind of is yeah and and the other side of that is like that's I, part of lady porn it's part of the genre right <laughs> it is that's it's, it's i'm telling you man and the other side of it is that like i never hated him either like did but, you feel sympathetic to him no no no, I mean, I, I felt I sympathetic to his situation, him. but I didn't feel 
Yeah. Like he he there was never a moment where I was like, "Oh god, that poor guy." I agree. I first he, of all, he's he's kind of the antagonist in the piece and he's sort of underwritten relative to everybody else. Um, and I like that he's gray. I mean, I like that he's he's not a bad guy, but at the guy. same time, you know. I mean, the most memorable thing about him is he combs his hair a lot when he's, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah. But I agree with and you. I think a, a better on. actor. I mean, I think Sam Neill's a great actor and everything, but um He's a little flat, and especially, you know, relative to everybody else in that movie, I think he comes off even flatter. Like, maybe he was looking for a dinosaur to come around the corner or something. I don't know, but I that think that... That would have been good. Well, that would have been a shock. I didn't, I didn't buy him. I, he felt more mannered, and, you know, his big scene where he essentially tries to rape her, um, did not buy that scene. Twice. He tried to rape her twice? Mm-hmm. Why did I forget the second rape? Which one are you talking about? Well, there's the one in the woods... Oh, yeah. There was the one where she talks to him. I'm yeah. talking about the one in the bedroom after right. he's on board yeah. the windows and yeah. stuff. Yeah. That scene seemed really kind of forced. And well, false. that's the thing. It's like, I felt like, it's like, why is he stopping? Like, it's just like, rapists don't really stop. Yeah, Sam Neill always seems to be kind of indicated. I felt like Holly Hunter and Anna Packman and Harvey Keitel gave very naturalistic performances, and his was much more mannered and stiff. And um, there was a what could have been a much more interesting moment where he's witnessing them screwing and through the slats. It should have been oh, yeah. devastated. Yeah. And there's that cool detail where the dog's licking his hand and then he wipes it off on the right. slats. Like, that could have been a big, rich moment for him and it felt flat to That's me. what I mean. It's, like, it's yeah. like, I should have felt bad for him at that point. Right. And it's like, instead of just like, come on, next scene, let's go. Well, you never liked him from the beginning. He gave her piano away, the one thing she loves. Yeah. I know, but again, like I said, I never never hated him either. See, now, what was cool about the movie, though, is... So Sam Neill's written that way, and he is kind of, eh, whatever. But um, the fact that Harvey Keitel, being this roughneck guy, you know, um, is going to be the contrast to that, that could have been really icky and, and... false as well but the way I sort of bought Harvey and the way that he's like he didn't ever get warm and fuzzy he's always like Mm -mm. look I just I want the piano so I can look up your dress and how many keys for you to come over here and lay you know it was was really cut and dried and it seemed in character and and the fact that Harvey is not indicating so much made me believe him you know what I mean Mm mm-hmm Best actor is Holly Hunter. You know, I'm just thinking the good news, bad news for Holly Hunter is, you know, you're going to star in this movie. The good news is you don't have to learn any dialogue, <laughs> right, right. no dialect, yeah. you know, but you, you do have to learn sign language and you have to actually play the piano because she got well, a credit as actually playing the piano. She, yeah, yeah, she played yeah. all the, she played the piano and she taught Anna Paquin sign language. So she got a credit right. for being the credit. sign language coach for Anna Paquin. I thought Holly Hunter was great in it too. I thought oh, she, you cool, know, of course, that's, that's. Obviously, that's actor bait, you know, to give someone a role like that. But yeah. she, to, to really... But that kind of, it felt did. like actor bait. Yeah, maybe. It felt like, you know, the guy with the limp. The guy, you know, who, you know, Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. Um, oh, I... Yeah, he is a, fair enough. Boy, Chris is so cynical. I know. <laughs> I think it would be hard as an hung actor. Out like, you don't have any lines. <laughs> You I know, but I felt like I felt like she was emoting all of that through her performance, but look, and this, I was like, this it was movie, like, oh my god, this, I felt she was, she was over I, the top. I want to say something, which is, I, I, I agree with you that you know, objectively, it's kind of an actor bait sort of performance. But I, I, another thing that struck me is that this movie, these days, would be like Oscar bait kind of movie. Yeah, but it, it totally didn't feel like it was coming that place from that place to me. It felt like so authentic and no, so I agree with that way. too. And I mean, it, I, I just. I wasn't, I don't want to say it was, I don't know, I wasn't blown away by her performance. I think it was great because she, all she has to act with is, you know, her face. She's covered up from mostly neck to, to hands in those outfits, you know, her hair's in a bun. And she, her character doesn't show a lot of emotion through her face, like real smiling and frowning and real obvious open emotions. But you still see like in her eyes and, and you know, in her you know, quiet actions, how she feels. And then but when, see, she I don't, plays, when she plays, how she really, exactly. you know, Now she interacts with her daughter and they have a real close loving relationship. Yeah. But I guess, I see, I the, feel like she was screaming in that performance. Oh, Dude. I didn't get Yeah, that she was always like, oh, waving her wow. arms and frowning and I pouting. I could not disagree more. Oh, yeah. Really? She was very, uh, there was a very couple well scenes modulated. In the beginning, and, well, only when she it was about the piano was when she showed some kind of angry emotion. Other than that, she was pretty... But I, I think, I think Holly it. Hunter gave an extraordinary performance, too. But I, I also sort of agree with Chris that it's, it's a little bit of Oscar bait. It's kind of like 
going full retard or something, you know, it's like, it's, uh, you know what I mean? It's, I just, I it's just, showy in a weird way. I just felt like she kind of overacted. It's like possible. I felt there were moments where it was sort of like, this is me screaming and, yeah. you know, but I'm it's, not going to scream. So, you know, it's tough to do without talking. Best actor nominee, Harvey Keitel. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, I think Harvey Keitel, uh, he gets a little bit of a bum rap because he's done some of these over-the-top performances and he's always sort of typecast as the Goomba guy. I thought it was really interesting casting on Jane Campion's part. And, um, and I, th- I thought it totally worked. And I think Harvey was totally believable as a guy who, you know, I was kind of wondering, it's, it's another thing that they, you know, it's like we're saying, they don't really touch on what this village is that they're living. Right. We don't really, really get any sense of his backstory. He had that funny right. little scene with the, the villagers about what happened to your wife. He's like, oh, my wife has her own life. Enough said, you know? Like, right. Fill in the blanks. He seemed to have money. He was able to get off the island. It looked like they had a nice house. Well, he had land. Because didn't he trade he land? Had, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had, yeah. He had a lot of yeah. land. And the fact that he was willing to um, trade his land and, and take on this piano, that he really didn't even try to pretend he had an interest in playing the piano. Right. It was really just, I really want to look up your skirt, honey. You know? And it's like... I just thought his character was really well uh, drawn and really believable, and I, I thought Harvey was great casting. I just can't buy this guy outside of New York. Really? Yeah. Well, the the famously bad casting was him in Ta- Last Temptation of oh Christ. Oh, my God. <laughs> Didn't he play? Who did he play in that? He played the lion that comes out of... Well, the, I think he voices the lion that comes out of the desert. Oh, he, he was not Oh, he played camera? Judas. Didn't he play Judas? I think he played Judas, yeah. Yeah, but I think he also had, was the voice of the lion. I just remember that lion coming out of the desert and going... Wait, what year was... Hello, what? Jesus. It's like, what are you, David and Goliath? <laughs> Davy and Davey Goliath. Davy and Goliath, yeah. Oh, man. What year was Last Temptation? I don't know. Because that should be coming up. That would be a fun one to revisit. That will be. You know, I saw him once in Failsafe. George Clooney did a live oh, yeah. recreation of Failsafe. And since seeing him in that movie, he couldn't remember his lines because it was a live television piece. Oh. And every time I've seen him since, I just see him stumbling for his lines. Well, you know, it's a good point you make, which is I think there are actors that are actor actors, you know, and they really just, you know, blend into whatever character they're playing and kind of, you know, become that. And there's actors that I think, and Harvey definitely falls in this category, which is just they have a certain compelling yeah, screen presence right, and right. sometimes they work in a role and sometimes they yeah. don't. And, you know, he, he doesn't seem like he's working that hard. He just kind of is. And um, you're right. I mean, you see him like in Taxi Driver or something. It's like... He's so interesting and he's mm-hmm. so believable. Um, that's why I say I think you know, as a guy who just like went through the casting process and how brutal that can be. I mean, I don't know what Jane Campion's status was when she made this movie. If she had the choice of anybody she wanted, right, right. Um, or if he was even kind of pushed on her. Maybe I mean yeah. he obviously because of Reservoir Dogs he probably right. had international right. value and yeah. all that. Yeah. But you would think Sam Neill and Holly Hunter would be enough of a package for a seven million dollar movie. I don't know. It also, would Sam yeah. Neill of... wasn't. Uh, that movie came out. It was probably made before or around the same time as Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah but Sam Neill I think was pretty <clears throat> prominent as an Australian actor right. already. But yeah. anyway, regardless, the business isn't the point. The point is, um, that was a brave choice on Jane Campion's part, um, and. Uh, and I, I think I think that's, you know, it's it's an old cliche that's so true, which is casting is ninety percent of it. Yeah, she yeah. had good instincts. Uh, best original screenplay, Jane Campion. As you said, about three pages long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, she, but you she know won what I'm saying, Chris? Because you, you know what I'm talking about. Like these days, um, you know, twenty years later, we're all so you know everyone's writing a screenplay and everyone knows all the rules of screenwriting now. Yeah, and it's so prevalent and. Um, uh, I don't know if I made up that title or if I heard that title, but that idea of like the tyranny of Save the Cat or something. There's I just read an interesting article about how, hey, do you notice that every movie out this summer is sort of hits all the same beats? It's because we've all read the same book, you know. And, right. Um, I like that. Uh, you, I imagine Jane Campion sitting down to write this movie with a theme in mind, and obviously a lot of uh, you know emotional passion and, and imagination to draw on. But I bet she didn't have much of a roadmap going. I bet she didn't beat it out on three by five cards. I bet she really oh, like, I don't let think the story so. yeah. play out. Yeah. And I enjoyed that. To that point, though, I would say there's a reason I think I don't remember it 20 years later. Like, honestly, I don't remember anything about the movie 20 years from 20 years ago. And it's just sort of like I just remember the tone of it. I remember the, the, te- of it. I remember the texture I mean, of it. That, you know, 
you can argue there's some movies you remember for the story. There's some movies you remember for other elements. I mean, right. This is definitely, it's yeah. not the narrative of this story that's yeah. what's remarkable about it. Right. You know? uh, best director, Jane Campion. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I mean, it. it's definitely... No, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, finish your point. I was going to say, I mean, again, it's visually striking. It's told in a visual fashion. I appreciate all of that. My memory of this movie has always been that, that it was like, well, yeah, I remember it being something that I could watch and follow, but again, nothing ever stayed with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I give her more credit for a couple of reasons. One, because you know she's a writer-director, and this movie had a very um, complete and original feeling to it. I also am so uh, more tuned in now than I was probably 20 years ago to the actual craft of it, and um, her filmmaking isn't real flashy, but if you really like break it down and really analyze it, it's really precise. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. see all these really, all her, the camera's always kind of moving, it's always elegant, not real flashy, it's always telling the story, but really like clever blocking and all, you know, like long shots that keep revealing new things and mm-hmm. new angles. And um, I was struck by her uh, craftsmanship a lot more than I probably yeah. would have noticed. And I, you know, I, I'm really tuned to that now because, as you know, I'm making a movie right now. And, um, like, I, you know, knock myself out to come up with smart blocking and shots and stuff. And nobody ever notices it because we're right. so, you know, I think if stuff works, we're so accustomed to seeing, like, well-crafted films that unless it is something super showy, nobody notices. But I think her um, directing was excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'll nominate her this year. I, yeah. I think had it had this movie come out the year before the year after, I think I probably would have. But you mean the field's too strong this year? But I think the field's too strong this Who's year. Who's she up against? There's a well, ton Spielberg. of stuff. Schindler's List. Um, I think Groundhog Day is a great movie. Yeah. Um, but you don't think about the directing of Groundhog Day as much as the writing, right? I do in the sense that it's comedy, right? And so comedy, it's 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 one it's one of those things. Like going back to what you were just saying. It seems, it's seamless. It feels effortless. That's a movie that, like, when you watch it, it's like, well, of course, this is the only way you would watch it. You would, this is the only way this movie could be made. But it's like, no, there's a million ways you could make a movie like that. Yeah. So, so I just think it's a strong field. I don't know, you know, when it comes I, down know, to a, it. That's a good point. I, 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 comedy directing, just like comedies in general, tends yeah. to get underrated. Yeah, so. yeah. Best picture. Um, yeah, I don't know if, you know... With 2020 hindsight, this movie belongs in that pantheon or not? Yeah, I think if I nominate, as much as I've raved about it. No, today. no, no. But I mean, I think, I think, if anything, I think I would nominate her for best director, but probably not best picture. And that's yeah. rare when my brain has to like split those two yeah, up. Yeah, because you and I were sort of texting about this a little bit. It's uh, that's a rare thing that you can really bestow uh, on a movie. Like this is a great movie. I, I think this movie was an excellent movie, but not like a great movie in the sense of like all time great yeah. movies. Yeah. So has it stood? Has the piano stood the test of time? Um, I would say yes, in the sense that it's uh, it was really worth revisiting and um, and has a lot to you know a lot of value in it still, but. Um, I would say no in the sense that it does feel dated and, um, and you know, is not the movie I would take into the bunker with me before the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of great work in this movie, but I don't know if it, it's something like I would rush out to see. But Lowly, like you probably. I never saw it 20 years ago. And, and you were pleasantly I, I surprised, feel right? like, yeah, I feel like it wouldn't be made, if you made it today, if Jane Champion made it today, it wouldn't be much different. Yeah, I, I would circle back to the first point I made about this, which is what was striking about it is that an authentically female uh, movie, which is not a girly movie or, or lady porn in my estimation, um, is, uh, is a rarity now. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed that, you know. Well, thanks for joining us, too. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Grand Illusion Cinema and Honest Tea. If you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly four-year consideration screenings here in Seattle and a ticket to our annual ceremony in February. It's over a $100 value for only $40. 
To enroll, just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. And until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past.